Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. All right. Well, howdy. howdy. It's good to see you guys. It's awesome to be back uh, in Houston. Uh, did I miss anything? Anything interesting going on in Houston the last couple months? No? Crazy. You know, they say uh, that you're never more Texan than when you're outside of Texas, which is true. We're a bit obnoxiously so. But I think it's true of Houston, too. You're never more Houstonian than when you're out of Houston. I mean, we have been our pride in Houston watching the response, the generosity to one another through Harvey was just absolutely inspirational. So if I can be a voice from a far off land, I was wearing my Houston sweatshirt, Don and I all different places and people would come up to us. Hey, how are your people there? What's going on there? We're praying for Houston. It's unbelievable. And they tell stories of what they saw in the news. And I'm like, I know, right? And so it's just been amazing for the world to see what we all know, which is Houston is just an incredible place. And then the World Series, I mean, come on. I mean, like, that doesn't solve all the problems, you know, of Harvey. There's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of loss. But if there was a year to win the World Series, this is, I mean, if it was a movie, you'd be like, okay, you know, but, <laughs> but then it happened. So unbelievable. And uh, someone's going to make that movie. And uh, man, unbelievable. So, so good to be here. If you got a Bible, I want to read a passage out of 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, and then we'll pray and jump in. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17. If you don't have one, just uh, listen up and, um, and we'll get there together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17, says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for this time around your word together. I just thank you for every person here, God, wherever they are on their journey uh, with you uh, and understanding you and in life, um, whether we know each other or not, I just thank you that you've given us this moment together to look at your word And I want to ask God that this would be revolutionary for us. And a service can't produce that, and I can't, but you can, God. So just rescue us from just doing a service and moving on. I pray, God, we we could touch down with heaven right now and really understand your heartbeat more than ever and then link up our lives uh, with what matters most to you. And so make this a, a significant moment for many, if not all of us, I pray. And I want to invite you guys, if you're willing, would you pray and ask him, say, God, please teach me right now. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Eric Carl grew up in Nazi Germany as a child, was conscripted to dig trenches, wasn't a great life. And so he longed to get out, particularly longed to get to America. And so in his early 20s, he was able to do that. With $7 in his pocket, he arrived in New York City and he got a job as an illustrator. And someone saw his potential, began to move him into the publishing world where he did Uh, illustrations for books. But then at age 40, Eric wrote his first book entitled The Hungry Caterpillar. Some of you are familiar. 
If you have children like me, you probably own a handful of these because Eric's first book did okay. And if you don't know what The Hungry Caterpillar is about, it's about a caterpillar who's very hungry. And so he just eats things. And then at the end of the book, spoiler alert, goes into a cocoon and then comes out as a butterfly, right? And simple story, maybe 10 pages of a caterpillar eating all kinds of things, watermelons and lollipops and stuff like that, and then becoming a butterfly, something we all see coming. And yet, over the last 40 or so years, the book sold over 44 million copies. That's roughly one copy per minute since the book came out over 40 years ago. The man has made $100 million on this book, right? My first book has not performed as well. <laughs> it's done all right, but Eric tapped into something. I'm like, uh, okay, in my defense, my book doesn't have any illustrations. Maybe that's the problem. I missed something there. But still, 44 million copies of a story that we all know what's coming. Why did we do it? Why do we continue to spend money on it? Well, we could argue, oh, man, well, the, you know, the illustrations are so comf uh, colorful and the caterpillar is so hungry. Like, but, but that doesn't explain $100 million. I think we're drawn to the simple story because woven into all of us is that sense that we need a change. We need a recreation. We are something valuable, but we feel it existentially, all of us. We're made to be more. We're not fully what we're meant to be. And that comes out in conversations with people in different ways. Man, I just got to get in shape. Man, I just got to get a different job. Man, I just got to get married. Man, I just got to get in that circle of people and out of this circle of people. Man, I got to get out of this town and into that town. Man, I need to quit hanging here. I need these people to know me. I need to make these adjustments. But all these conversations I have with people is a sense of, man, where I am is not where I'm supposed to be. What I am is not what I feel like we, I'm meant to be. And I just run into people all the time that feel that sense of dislocation with creation. I'm not all that I'm meant to be. And I think all of us feel that because in the very deepest levels, it's true. We are made by God and we are made for God. And yet all of us like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. There's something wrong with all of us. There's a dislocation with heaven in all of us that has dislocated things in us. And what's fascinating is I think even books like The Hungry Caterpillar point to what's woven deep in our hearts. We're made for more. And it points to what Paul proclaims in this passage that we proclaim in the church, the people of Jesus celebrate. He says it in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. We are made by God, but there's something broken in us and we need to be made new. And the good news is that in Jesus Christ, God is doing that. God has come to us and that reckless love we were singing about changes us. It's interesting. I was at A&M this weekend and spoke to the football team. I did their chapel and we talked about that, that the remedy for anxiety is intimacy with God. What we need more than anything is not to turn over a new leaf, but to be touched by our creator, to be made new by God. And we talked about the movie Taken. I don't know if you saw that movie. It's been a couple years now with Liam Neeson. You remember that one? Surprised Hollywood how well it did. Uh, I remember going to see it in the theaters and it, the theater was just filled with like junior high girls. And it confused Hollywood. They're like, why are junior high girls slamming into a movie about like a 60-year-old guy, Liam Neeson? And they're like, do we need more 60-year-olds? What's going on? And the story just tapped into something. That if you don't know the story, Liam Neeson's daughter's kidnapped and taken overseas. And so Liam just goes out and gets a different daughter, just moves on. It's like, oh, well, lost one, right? Is that true? No. no, what happens? He goes after her to get his daughter, and that's the whole story, to get her back. She was taken, and he goes through all kinds of stuff to get her home and bring her home safely, and it did so well. Now they've made Taken 2 and Taken a third time and Taken again, and we lost her again, and they're just kind of milking the series. But the first one was pretty poignant and really touched down with a lot of people. And I told them that story and I was like, now imagine that girl that was taken. Imagine if she was a real girl and years later when she was safe at home in her bed, if she laid in bed and asked that question, most people do at some point. What if she laid in bed and said, I wonder if anybody cares about me? 
I wonder if anybody cares about what I care about, thinks about me. I wonder if I'm on anybody's radar. Does, do I matter to anybody? I said, what would you say to that girl? What you'd say is, watch the movie! <laughs> Your dad crossed oceans for you. Your dad like blew up a plant for you. Your dad electrocuted a guy. It was really grim. But your dad just risked his life to come get you and to bring you to where you were meant to be. And that's our gospel. That's our message. We were singing about that, the overwhelming, reckless love of God that chases us down, that God sent Jesus Christ, not at the risk of his life, but the very cost of it. Our passage says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we may be right with God. God sent Jesus running for us to take us from where we are into where we're meant to be, from broken to healed, from filled with guilt and shame to forgiven and made alive, from dislocated to reconciled with God, from abandoned to part of the very family of God. And the people of Jesus never get over that message. That is our message. Our message is not turn over a new leaf, be a better person. Our message is God is intersecting with human beings where we are. And it says anyone who's in Christ, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how shame-filled your story, no matter how much you've achieved or how much you've failed, every human being is not what we're meant to do, be, but God has come. Jesus Christ is making the old new. A metamorphosis happens in Christ, that the old is gone, the new has come. That's our message. So Donna and I have a dear friend that years ago was a meth addict living in a homeless shelter in Atlanta. And someone came to him in that state where he had been stealing money from friends and family and what some would call a danger to society. Someone came to him and shared with him the reckless love of God that chases down even someone like him and meets him in the lowest places. And he believed that message. God came for me. God loves me. And he put his faith in Jesus Christ. And the old became new. Dana got healthy. Dana got, got sober. Dana got healed. And man, he became a force for good. And so just this year in Atlanta, Passion City Church in Atlanta mobilized over 3,000 people to work at over 160 projects all around the city. Over six years of man hours serving in the shelters of the city, in needy schools in the city, all over Atlanta. The love of God came flowing through it. And you know who organized that whole thing? That same guy. The guy that had lived in those shelters is now a force for good in those shelters. And you look at that and you go, that's the gospel. I talked to an Uber driver the other day. And as we're driving, he says, nobody changes. Good people, good people, bad people, bad people. No one can change what they are. And I said, I need you to meet a friend of mine because I don't think you know what you're saying. And I need you to not just meet him. I need you to meet the guy behind him because it's Jesus who changes people, right? The old becomes new. That's our message and we never get over it. And yet the truth is, just like my friend, we don't just become recipients of the message. Did you notice? We don't just become a new creation. It says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, bringing us in, not counting our trespasses against us, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. What he's saying there is we don't just become rescued, we become rescuers. We don't just become the reconciled, we become reconcilers. When God makes you new, forgiven, clean in Christ, you don't just receive that message, you also become a messenger. You don't just become the rescued. He pulls you into the story to be a rescuer, to join in this campaign of letting the love of God be made known to others. You become Robin. My little two-year-old son is obsessed with Batman. We talk about Batman about 20 times a day. Um, he's using it as a compliment now. When he sees something he likes, he's like, that's Batman. And I'm like, that's actually kind of a cool compliment for something. Like, I may start using that. But we were at the playground the other day, and he was there, and this little kid was following him around, just uh, enamored with my son, who, who is 
two years old and weirdly articulate. So he is kind of uh, an anomaly and an interesting thing. So this kid is just following my son around wherever. And so I walked up to Owen. I said, hey, buddy, how you doing? What's going on? And he said, I'm Batman, which is pretty standard. And I said, who's your buddy? And he goes, Robin. (laughs) And the kid goes, no, I'm Henry. And Owen just goes, Robin. (laughs) And the kid went with it, right? And they went on their crime fighting adventures together. And you look at that and you go, Batman and Robin, man, that's one of our iconic American stories, right? Who was Robin? An abandoned kid, lost his parents, homeless, without hope in the world. And he got adopted by a millionaire, right? And became his son, became his child, right? But that's not the end of the story. I don't just become the child of Bruce Wayne. I become the partner of Batman, right? I don't just become someone who receives. I become someone who becomes a part of the force for good that's solving problems. I don't just sit in the mansion and go, isn't it nice here? I got seven fireplaces. I'm someone who says, he rescued me. Now I'm joining in that rescuing work. And that's what we are. Paul says the people of Jesus, when his grace is touched down on us, we become deliverers of grace to other people. That's our story. We're ambassadors, representatives of Jesus, wherever he would send us, that we would let people know about the grace of God that touched down in our lives. That's who we are. So for me, this has been enormously helpful when I evaluate my life. People ask me all the time, how do you make decisions on where you're supposed to work, where you're supposed to live? How do you live life? This identity of I'm an ambassador of Christ, and I don't work for me, I work for him. There's a great campaign of rescue going on, and I join that. That has informed decisions my entire life. And Ken asked me if I would share in the context of this some of Donna and I's story, how we got to where we are and what we're doing. And this played a big part of it. Our first year of marriage, Donna and I were living in Dallas, I was going to school there and we got an offer to work at a church that was an amazing church with all of our friends in the city we were living in doing incredible things and God was blessing it. And at the same time, I got offered the job to be director of Breakaway, a Bible study on the campus of Texas A&M that had been flourishing like crazy, but the previous director had gone on to be a pastor here in Houston and now it was operating without a director and its future was a bit uncertain. And I looked at these and I'm like, Dallas, we already live here. My school's here. Our friends are here. We could hang out with the people we like, doing things we like at a place we like, and God is blessing it. There's a million reasons to stay here. It's safe and it's comfortable and we understand it, right? And God calls people to Dallas and Dallas is needy. And yet we looked and I said, but you know what? In College Station, I don't know anybody. I don't know if this ministry is necessarily gonna be one that continues. And, and I don't know if I'm the, you know, how some of these things are going to work with this place. And so there was a lot of uncertainty. But when we went there, God was moving in the lives of students through this ministry. And finally, I was trying to figure out, like, what does your heart tell you? And I'm like, that it's stressed? I don't know. You know, people are going like, follow your heart. And I'm like, I don't know what my heart says. And so finally, I just said, who am I? I'm an ambassador of Christ, him making his appeal through us. And I'm like, God dispatches representatives of his kingdom where they're needed to represent the kingdom. And I looked at this church in Dallas and I said, there are so many gifted, talented, wonderful men and women reaching the lost through this church. I could join it, but I'm not necessary. But I look at this opportunity here and it's a round hole in this ministry. And Donna and I are a round peg. And so if I were a general leading God's army, I would send us there. And so that was our answer. Old school Christians used to say the church is one of two things, either the church triumphant or the church militant. The church triumphant meant all the believers in Jesus who are already with him in heaven. The church militant are those of us who are part of God's cause on the earth. We don't use that language as much now because church militant brings up like terrorism and something, but that's not who we are. We don't persecute. We fight for people, not against people. We fight to rescue people, not persecute them. That's our story. And yet it became easy for us to make decisions like this because we're like, the big arc storyline is not how I can get to the safest place, but how I can get to the most strategic place for God's purposes. And you know that's how God works, right? God's always been doing that. 
sending out his ambassadors, not always to the safest places, but to the most strategic places. It started in Genesis. Now, when God called Abraham in Genesis, after the world went nuts, God said, I'm gonna pick one guy, I'm gonna bless you. And then he didn't say, I'm gonna bless you. And then, you know, click in neutral, man, post up, coast out of this life and hopefully die in your sleep. That's not what he says. He says, I'm gonna bless you and you will be a blessing. And then he sends him from Ur the Chaldees all the way to this little strip of land along the Mediterranean coast. God makes him move to this little piece of land. Now, if God just wanted to keep Abraham safe, he would not have sent him there. That little strip of land has been a part of like every major war in history or something. It's unbelievable. The Romans conquered it. The Greeks conquered it. All different kinds of people have conquered it. It's a very dangerous place to be. If God just wanted to keep Abraham safe, he would have sent him to like Madagascar or something. Because <laughs> no one attacks Madagascar. You never read in the news. You're like, well, somebody's trying to attack Madagascar again. Remember the game Risk when you were a kid? You're trying to take over the world. People were like, oh man, we forgot about Madagascar. You can just have it, right? Like it's not as much happening. People are still fighting over that little strip of land. And God put Abraham there. Why? Because that little strip of green is the only place on the planet that connects three major continents. And God said, I'm going to bless somebody. And then I'm going to bless him and not just make him safe. I'm going to bless him and make him strategic. I want to put him at the crossroads of the world. That's your Old Testament. And when Jesus arrived on the New Testament, that's where he lived because his forefather Abraham planted their family there. That was all by God's design so that the son of God, Jesus, could be born in that region. I was just there a week ago and stood up on a mountainside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Abraham was called to go to be in a strategic place. Jesus was called to stay. He stayed in that little area of real estate. And you could stand up there, and they're showing us, man, this is where, if you were traveling anywhere in Europe or Asia or Africa, you would go through this strip. And that was the supply line there at that little Sea of Galilee is where you would get fish and olive oil and food for the journey. It was the ideal place place, if you wanted the whole world to hear a message, you would plant your son right there. You can see the trade routes that he stood in the middle of, that every word of truth he spoke with authority, every offer of grace to the sinner, every miracle worked in power could be instantly known by the world because God set his son not in the safest place, but in the most strategic, in the very navel of the earth, one prophet will say. And so God's in the business of doing that. Let me put my people, not necessarily where they're the safest, but where they're the most strategic. So I challenge you, I don't know if you're supposed to move in life. You may be called to stay. There's a lot happening in Houston and a lot of needs. But what I can say to you is this. I don't know if you're called to move. I don't know if you're called to stay. But what I can say is if you are called in Christ, you're called an ambassador. Wherever you are, God is sending you out to make his appeal through you be reconciled to God. Your office, your school, your neighborhood, we are ambassadors, representatives of his kingdom there. I live in Washington, D.C. now, just a few miles away from embassies. They're a presentation of a different kingdom, established to represent their kingdom in a different one. And that's what we're meant to be. You represent the kingdom of God in your neighborhood, in your school, at your work. This is where life is found, right? When you get on board this mission, I talk to so many people that are trying to figure out how to be happy in life. And let me tell you something, life is found in Christ and in his mission. I join him in what he's doing. Ambassadors get sent to represent the kingdom. And that's what we are, not just recipients, but we're representatives. We get the message and it makes us into messengers. So Donna and I moved to Breakaway. And people look at the pictures now and in the earlier gathering, I looked up and saw, man, the pictures of the stadium is like, this is overwhelming how much God blessed us there. And people look at that and I'll tell them, yeah, we moved to Breakaway 12 years ago. And they're like, well, of course you did. It was such an amazing ministry. And I'm like, slow up, man. Uh, We didn't get her at her best. All right. That journey to Breakaway felt like death. And the previous director, Greg, had done an amazing job, but it had hit this point in life where the money wasn't there. The challenges were there. I mean, I would speak in front of groups and the little sound system we had, it would shock me. Like physically, I'd be like, turn in your Bibles. Oh, God, like hand would be so hot. And uh, it was like, this is, this is hard. This is, uh, we chose this. Okay. Uh, and there were challenges, man. 
But we got to stand at the crossroads of this life. Texas A&M touches the world to stand there and reach the lives of young people and to send them out around the world. We were thrilled to do that. We loved it. It was so energizing to be in the will of God. And so we did that and we were happy in the work. We could stay here forever, God. But about six years ago, Louis Giglio came and visited College Station and he and I sat down and had lunch. Louis was the leader of a movement called Passion that had touched down in my life when I was a college student at a conference, being challenged to receive the transformative grace of God and then leverage my life for what matters most. That message sunk into me and Passion was a movement that was sweeping across the globe, helping people see and know the grace of God and leverage their lives for him. And so Louis after moving passion around the world, had also planted a passion city church in Atlanta and it was exploding. And so we sat at lunch and he told me he had a vision of seeing passion city churches planted in strategic cities all over the country and the world. And I instantly thought that's a great idea because as the cities go, so goes the culture. You wanna change the culture, you change a city. You wanna change the world, change a culture shaping city. And I thought that's a brilliant idea blessings, because I'm here doing my deal. All the best to you. Go get them. You know, didn't think about it. Was still rolling a breakaway. And I could go on and on about what happened next. But after a few more years of breakaway, we got to a point where I remember we were laying in bed and Donna and I were talking saying, you know what? Everything we're doing right now, we could do without faith. We could do without having to trust God. And that scared us because we were raising three little kids. And I didn't want them to hear their daddy talk about faith up front and then try to imagine propositionally what it might look like for someone to really trust God. I wanted them to see it. When they hear me talk about faith, I wanted them to go, oh yeah, like what you and mom are doing. And so that didn't mean leave College Station, it just meant, God, we wanna be leveraged into everything you're doing. We want to live lives where we're leaned so far out into you that if you're not real, we land on our face. But if you are real, the people around us see the power of God in a human life. And for us, that began to stir into a place of God letting us know your time at Breakaway is done. Right around that time, he was raising up a new director, Timothy Atik, who's killing it right now at Breakaway, doing amazing. And it's incredible to watch it carry on in different hands. And God sent us on a journey where we moved to Atlanta, joined Passion City Church, knowing we wouldn't stay in Atlanta, but knowing God was gonna call us to a strategic city somewhere in the country. So we moved and for six months, my wife and I flew around to different cities all over the country and we're praying over the churches there. And we didn't go to size up churches. We went to celebrate churches. And then we went to ask God, God, what city would you call us to? Which is a crazy life, by the way. I don't know who does that. Let's fly around the country and pray over all the major cities. That's pretty wild. I highly recommend it if you have the time. Because let me tell you something, and this is not even necessarily a part of the main message. This is for free. A uh, lot of fear about where our country is today. A lot of concern, and I think a lot of it's warranted. There's a lot of hostility, lack of empathy in the culture that's concerning. But one thing I can say is, as I visited all these different cities and visited churches in them, the kingdom of God is on the move. And ambassadors of Jesus are in every major city. Churches are thriving. Don and I would show up at places back in these cities in rougher parts of town and see thriving churches growing up, hundreds coming to worship here, thousands over there. It doesn't make the news, but let me tell you something. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is advancing and doing damage against the darkness all over America. Incredible stories of the grace of God on the move. And it was so encouraging for Donna and I to see God's kingdom is advancing. God is alive and moving. People are getting forgiven and healed and restored and released to be ministers in Jesus' name all over this country. This is amazing. And the whole time we were praying, God, where would you have us? The easy money was on Texas. <laughs> Most people were betting on that. We might have been among those people. We know Texas. We like Texas, we get Texas, we are Texas, right? Like it makes all the sense in the world to move back here. And yet we were visiting different cities and we went to Washington, D.C. And D.C. wasn't necessarily like, oh, I think we'll move there. Frankly, it was just one of the ones we were visiting, but we were surprised with what hit us when we got there. 
We showed up in D.C., and two things struck us right away. One, how young the city is. One out of three people that live within the district are between the ages of 20 and 35. Not under 35, between the ages of 20 and 35. One out of three humans in the city are basically in their 20s. The government is run by 20-year-olds. I don't know if you know that. I don't know how that makes you feel, but it's true. <laughs> Senators, representatives, they pop in and out. The people who live there are young, and they're running the government, all these young people, and we're sitting there, and it hits you right away. We'd be at stoplights, and I'm like, everyone walking by is young. We'd be at restaurants, and I'm like, we're the oldest people here. <laughs> it's just a city filled with young people. It's like Neverland or something. They're just all packed in the space. There's over 11,000 people per square mile in D.C. And 1,000 a month are moving into the city. And so we looked around. The second thing that struck us was the cranes in the air that we saw 30 of them just in, from one rooftop of buildings being built as fast as they can all over the city. People are flocking to it, so many coming. And there are amazing churches there, churches that are doing incredible things. And yet we saw the the ratio of churches to the need being different there than we saw in other cities. It's fascinating. D.C. has the incredible, unique position of being on the top of two major lists. One is the city with the most religious spaces. It's in the top 10. And the other list is one of the least religious cities in the country. Most religious spaces, tons of churches, multiple churches on every street corner, and yet one of the least religious cities in the country. And it's fascinating when you drive around, you'll see all these beautiful old churches becoming hotels, condos, uh, bars, or just being torn down and turned into something else. There's a church a block from my house. It's on Pennsylvania Avenue. From the front steps, you're looking at the capital of the United States. It's 0.1 miles from a metro station. You could not be in a more strategic place. And it's called Grace Church Condominiums because the building sold, and now it's condos in a strategic location, and the city's lost. And we looked at that, and we saw great need and great opportunity. We looked at Houston, and we're like, but we love Houston. We looked at Texas, and we're like, we love Texas. Our people are here. We get this place. We know this place. We want to be here. God's moving everywhere. We want to be a part of this, but we watched what was happening in Houston, particularly in Harvey. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but you stunned the world with the way you selflessly loved one another. And it's interesting to watch people fumble with it in the news. They're like, man, they're incredible in Houston, the way they're serving each other and all these stories of rescue. And people would walk up to me as I wore my Houston sweatshirt and they're like, what's going on with Houston? Y'all love each other so well. People risking their lives to save people. And it's interesting to watch people fumble around with like, what is it about Houston? Is it the humil humidity? It just, it just sort of sucks love and, and overwhelming generosity out of you? Hey, come on, guys. You're like, man, it didn't make the news a lot, but it would start to pop up in places. It's the people of Jesus in the city. And they're on the front lines of rescue. They're on the front lines of restoring people's homes. They're on the front lines of feeding the hungry. They're on the front lines. The church is killing the game in Houston. And I looked and saw friends of mine are leading massive, influential churches in the city and all around the state, man, that are leveraging what they have for the good of people. And then a younger friends of mine are planting churches strategically all through neighborhoods. And you look and go, the church is thriving in Texas. And yes, there's more need. Yes, there's so much need. And yet I looked at that and I realized, but in D.C., there is great need. There's great opportunity. And I looked at Donna and I said, we're round pegs and that's a round hole. And so the challenges come up. It's an expensive city, man. You pay twice as much money for half the house. My yard is about the size of that uh, pumpkin, right? <laughs> it's a transient city. People move in and out. And yet we looked at that and said, none of those are obstacles. Money is not the obstacle. Transience isn't the obstacle. You look and you go, this is a strategic place to be. And God's called us to be ambassadors. So we're going to go. And let me show you, tell you something. People were worried for us. They're like, what about your kids? You're going to raise your kids in the north. You know? <laughs> and we showed up there, and I told people, house, neighborhood, school, if any of those would have been real stressful, it would have been hard to flourish there. 
We live in a great house in a great neighborhood, less than a mile from the capital of the United States. And our kids go to a great school where they love Jesus and are teaching our kids to do the same. Our kids are thriving in D.C. They really are. Our family is. There's no safer place to be than in the will of God. And so we had an email list we started of people, if you follow us online and want updates, sign up for an email update, and people did it. In October, we sent out two emails. If you want to go to a little interest meeting, we're going to host a little interest meeting in this building in D.C., and we did our first meeting in October. And 250 people jammed into this little room, shocked us. Two emails, not a big marketing campaign, but people rolling in from all walks of life, man, all different places, ethnically diverse, all different places, people that are working in jobs in the city, driving Ubers and people that are working in the service industry and people who are doing jobs that they can't tell you or else they'd have to kill you, like that kind of thing. It's funny to watch them do that. I'm like, so what do you do? I do things with people. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. All right, all right, I got you. And, uh, and yet so many are alone in the crowd. Some of the people that were working the front door with us said they roll in in ones and twos because people here don't know people. They came up here to make a difference in the world by themselves. Their families aren't here. Their people aren't here. They're longing for community. And it was a powerful gathering of people who want to see Jesus move in the city. And man, something happened in October. We invited that group to a community group. Let's get around tables, get to know each other, study the gospel of Mark together. And over 100 of them showed up at the Eastern Market, one of the oldest markets in the country. We gathered there to study the word of God together. People there were floored by what we're doing. Security guard that was working for us came up and said, what is this? Like, who are you people? What is this? And we said, we're a church, man. We're starting in this city. And he said, well, whatever y'all are doing, I want to be here from now on. And I'm either going to work it or if I'm not working it, I'm going to be here. Right? And he also told one of our team, this is one of the most diverse gatherings I've ever seen of anything in D.C., and again, there's some churches that are killing it in the city, but the reality is it's a pretty segregated city. And yet God reconciles everyone into his family. And we want to be a picture of that. And God was doing that. We held another vision night last week and we picked a little art gallery right in the center of the city. And again, people packed it out, standing room only of people that, that want to be a part of something more. They want to know God and they want to make him known. And so God is moving, and it's exciting to see what God's up to. So pray for us. We're just on the front end of it. We got one more vision night, some more community groups, and we're trying to build a we that can launch a church in the spring. And yet it's fascinating and to look at that and to see God moving and how exciting it is and to see how God's prepared us along the way. I've been in ministry for 20 years now, and I've never worked for a ministry where the sanctuary was in the same building as my office. Isn't that weird? Who does that? That when God called me into ministry, I got hired by Ken Werlein, an incredible leader, planting a church when no one even said words like that. Like, what do you mean planting a church? And we met in his apartment. My office was his breakfast nook. <laughs> and yet I got to watch firsthand an incredible leader build a church and to roll in and to set it up and be portable and to see something grow. And then I went from there to Breakaway where we'd have to roll in every week and transform arenas into sanctuaries every single week. And I'm looking, I'm like, I don't know anyone else that for the last two decades has just been a portable church. What is going on with this? And then I showed up in DC and I'm like, oh, now I'm starting a church. And we have to roll into all these venues and do this. And it's with a young, transient culture of people who's, whom I've lived among for the last 12 years. And people are like, they're all young. I get that. They're all transient. Right, I get that. You're going to have to set up mobily. Yeah, I bet I can figure that out. And I looked up and I'm like, I think God has been preparing me for this <laughs> for a long time. I had a karate kid moment of like, this whole time I was learning and I had no idea. I don't know what he's preparing you for. I don't know if he's calling you to go. I don't know if he's calling you to stay. I don't know where he's calling you, but I know that if you're in Christ, he's called you an ambassador. And he's not gonna always put you in the safest places, but he's gonna put you in strategic ones. And we are meant to be recipients of grace and conduits of it. The rescued and the rescuers. Receiver of the message and then messengers to get it out to a lost and dying world. And you're never more alive than when you're in the will of God. And so let me say thank you for supporting us. Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, thanked God for them. He said, because of their partnership in the gospel.
because you're partakers of grace with me. And at Breakaway and through my whole life, when I look at Faith Bridge, I go, this is home, man. This church has been partakers of grace of God with me and partners with us to get the gospel out. Thank you for that. And let me close with this to challenge you. We are meant to be participants in getting the gospel out. At Passion City Church in Atlanta, there's a wall we call the Jesus' Life Wall. It's a big wall. covers the whole entryway, and it's all these little light bulbs. And what it is is when someone puts their faith in Christ, they ascend this ladder and they screw a light bulb in to show the world, I'm in. Jesus has given me life. And we decided to do it that way so that when people walk into church, they they would resist the mentality of just being a guest at church. We're meant to be hosts at church. And the idea is, man, people would get there and it's the coolest thing. If you show up for a gathering and are walking out the door, it's not uncommon to see somebody ascending those stairs and a little crowd around them of their friends, watching them put that light bulb in and then the whole room will cheer for them as they do it. And what's cool about it is that little crowd around the latter is the people who helped them meet Jesus and find life. And it's routine for people when they see that wall to have conversations about who their light bulb is. And you go, what does that mean? And they go, someone told me about Jesus and he gave me life. So who's my light bulb? Who's the person I'm gonna tell about Jesus so they can spring to life and we can keep it rolling. And man, that's our call. That if you don't know him, life is found in Jesus Christ. He's making the old new in him, reconciling us to God and giving us the ministry of reconciliation. And when you get on board that, that's where life is found. Jesus is life. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you, God, that your message is not a pep talk. Your message is an invitation to be rescued, forgiven, loved. So God, I pray for any here today who thought maybe religion is just be a good person. I just think there's some people that maybe it's dawning on them. Jesus came to rescue me, to forgive me not at the risk of his life, but at the cost of it. He who knew no sin became sin so I could be right with God. And if you're feeling that today, you can tell him, I want in. If you're healing, heal me. If you're forgiving, forgive me. If you're adopting, adopt me. If you're making the old new, I want in. And anyone is welcome. And if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. And you can know today that the old is gone and the new has come. You put your faith in him. And then God, for those of us who know you, may we not just be recipients of that message, but may we be ambassadors of it, messengers to the world. And I pray even now, as you pray, ask him that, God, where are you putting me? What's the strategic place you've placed me? In my office, at my school, in our neighborhood, what would it look like for me to be an ambassador, a representative, to live on the cutting edge of faith, God, so that I can live my life letting people know the one who I've come to know, offering life to people because Jesus has given me life. Thank you, God, for entrusting us with the ministry of reconciliation. May we send it out in power in Houston and in D.C. and to the ends of the earth until the day we are the church triumphant, home with you. Thank you, God, for this story. In Jesus' name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lorianne Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Ben Stewart, who just brought a message about the message and the messengers, which I hear is your last message with us before Passion City launches yeah 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 all right so let's so. talk about that okay okay sure. so fill us in a little bit you told us uh, a little bit about your transition and the decision uh, that God led you to to Washington DC uh, and you've been there now for how long a little over two months a little over two months so yeah. tell us how Donna's doing and the girls and the family how's how's yeah. all of that they're doing great I mean uh, and thank you for asking it's 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 interesting, I've been telling people if the house, the neighborhood, or the kids' school, like if any of those would have been stressful, 
it had been very hard to think church. Mm -hmm. But we went up and looked at dozens of houses and literally we were done looking, we're like, let's just try one more, let's just test it out. And we went and it was amazing right in the middle of the city, less than a mile from the capital, mm -hmm. across the street from the Eastern Market, a big outdoor market, in really the only part of the city where you see children and you see a lot oh, of kids. Yeah. But the house was packed with people all looking at it. And so mm. our realtor was like, do you want this house? Let's go, 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 go. And so we literally like speed walked to the management company, got the house, so we're in an amazing, we're renting it. <coughs> Uh, but we are in an amazing house, an amazing neighborhood, and then we found this little school they go to, this classical Christian school that they are just thriving in. Oh, the girls awesome. love it, and it's been wonderful. And, I mean, the nation's capital is our playground, so we go to Smithsonian's with the kids, and it really is like they are flourishing there. That's so, so good. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, when, when that is all put in place, too, then you can focus on... The church and the future yes. of the church. So tell us more about that. You told us a little bit about your vision nights that you've been having. Yes. What's the plan? When do you launch? What's happening? Yeah. So right now, community groups, we're going to run them about twice a month. Mm -hmm. And that's really, yes, for me to teach the Bible. Yes, to give a sense of culture, like who we are. And it's to help us get to know people. And I think from there will be the seedbed of the people who mm -hmm. say, we're us, we're the church, we're gonna build this and we're trusting that out of that group, God will raise up, mm -hmm. we call them door holders, people who right. will hold the door open to welcome the community in yeah. to what God has done. So uh, those community groups will be running, we'll do maybe one more vision night at the end of this month, but community groups will run into the spring. Mm -hmm. Passion Conference is coming to DC oh, in wow. January. Oh that's awesome. Oh my gosh, there's a brand new venue in D.C., mm -hmm. seats 3,000 people called the Anthem. We sold it out in weeks, and so thousands of young people will mm -hmm. be in this arena in D.C., mm -hmm. and we'll be there working with them, and then coming out of that in January, we'll do a couple worship nights, building towards, Lord willing, launching later in the spring. So okay. pray for us. We're, we're we not telling as, people the exact date, because <laughs> right. we're Cause like, you know, we're you know, checking we're out venues, <laughs> we're figuring out spaces, yeah. but... Um, but it'll be, you know, Lord willing, spring 2018. So it's coming soon. Yeah. But follow us on Instagram, okay. Twitter is probably the best place. That's where we can keep up with everything that's happening. Yes. Yeah. And then from there, you can sign up for email updates and and uh, watch what God does. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be joining you in prayer. And then today we had the exciting opportunity that for the next seven days we can give towards oh the gosh. mission that you're there. So it's exciting to see what God's going to do through that. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a privilege for us to see you uh, being the messenger in Washington, <laughs> D.C. and that we get to be part of that. So, yeah, yeah. it's very special. Uh, we'll be joining you in prayer for that. So thanks for being with us. I know it's a busy season for you. It's yeah. always a joy to have you here. Thanks. thanks. Love it. All right. Thanks for joining us today for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.